Good afternoon and welcome to the RespectAbility webinar for 2000, uh, in two, for Wednesday, is it Wednesday? No, it's Tuesday, sorry, busy day, but December 13th, 2016. My name is Philip Polly. I am the Policy and Practices Director for RespectAbility and um, today I'm wearing both of those hats very much. This morning I was running around for some meetings on Capitol Hill talking about disability employment policy with my colleagues from the CCD task force and today I'm putting on my practices hat to share with you some really exciting and innovative work that's being done around mentoring and employment for young professionals with disabilities. Um, I'm pleased to be joined today by Derek Shields and Anna Cunningham, um, who have some very valuable perspectives on what it means to um, coordinate a mentorship program for young professionals getting into the workplace, but also to be a mentee, to be someone who um, is, you know, kind of learning from an older peer who has guidance and insights that can only really come from that one-on-one -on -one connection of a mentorship or arrangement. Um, we're going to be talking a lot about um, a lot of different elements that are involved with the kind of the sharing of ideas, knowledge, experience that come as part of a mentorship program. And so I'm absolutely del delighted by my, uh, to be joined by Derek and Anna today. So um, just to run you through our program, we've got our slides from um, Derek and Anna. They're going to talk through about a lot of issues. We're also going to be showing a YouTube video um, that talks a little bit bit about Anna's story. Um, unfortunately for our audience who are joining us on phone, um, I can't share the audio with that via video, but I'll tell you and everybody who wants, I will send both a link to the video as well as a PDF copy of today's slides. So we're going to go through that program and then I've got a few extra slides at the end I'm going to walk you through and uh, I think it's going to be a great presentation today. So to start with, I'm going to introduce you to Derek. Um, Derek is the pre president of Front for uh, Front Work Forward Works Consulting um, for Policy Works. He serves as the VP and the co-chair of the mentoring committee that guides the Susan M. Daniels Mentorship Fund. As a project management professional, he has experience in strategic planning, program, and performance management. Former contract work includes Social Security's Ticket to Work program, the Walter Reed Army Medical Center's Assistive Technology Training Program the DOD's Office of Family Policy and Family Advocacy Program Office in support of DV and child abuse initiatives, DHS's Office of Assistive Services and Technology, as well as projects at, and this is the alphabet soup, HUD, DOI, DOT, State, Access, the Access Board, GSA, and the VA. So you can tell he has some experience and knows what's what. And then for Anna's background, she is a recent graduate of Case Western Reserve University with a degree in International Studies and Economics. Um, she currently works for Northrop Grumman. Um, and I don't know if our audience is aware, but Northrop Grumman has been one of those companies which has been really leaning in on making people with disabilities part of a diverse talent pipeline. They have been involved very intimately with the Disability Equality Index from AAPD and USBLN, which is how I've had the chance of meeting Anna and hearing her share her story which she's going to do again today. Um, she started with the company, that's Northrop Grumman, in the Professional Development Rotational Program where she gained experience in proposals, business operations, and HR. She recently graduated from the program and is now a manufacturing analyst where he, she works with organizations across the company. Prior to Northrop, she had in, in, internships at the Pentagon as part of the, um, as a diversity inclusion project manager, a manage, uh, project manager, um, the U.S. Department of State as a terrorism intelligence analyst, in case you couldn't tell that she's a really smart, talented lady. Um, beyond that, she has been very involved in disability inclusion, and I think she's a very good example of the real profound things that can be accomplished when we focus on people's abilities. So with that very long-winded introduction, I am going to shut up now. Derek, Anna, please take it away. Philip, thank you very much, and welcome everyone to today's webinar on employment mentoring and the National Disability Mentoring Coalition. I appreciate the opportunity that RespectAbility is providing our coalition and Anna and I to share with you our thoughts around um, mentoring, mentoring programs, our coalition, and our way forward and how mentoring can impact more lives of youth and at times adults with disabilities across the country. Um, so with that, a, a quick overview of the content that we're gonna dig into today. Um, our agenda is to review the National Disability Mentoring Coalition and our mission and what we do 
so you, we can ensure you have familiarity with that. We're going to go through um, the 40 uh, members, not all of them, but a, a sample of the members that uh, belong to the coalition, and importantly, look at a variety of mentoring models that exist in the country and ensure that we have a common understanding of those models. Um, next, we'll turn to uh, what we call the mentoring opportunity pipeline and resources that are available in the country for individuals to move uh, from program to program as they move from school to post-secondary education to transition into the workforce. And then once you're in the workforce, some models that exist there too as well. And it will be at that point that I will turn the floor over to Anna and Anna will provide a testimonial from her experience in one of the uh, pipeline programs. After Anna does that, we'll come back. We're going to talk about um, our dual strategy. We have a strategy about disability mentoring, but we also have an inclusion strategy to ensure mainstream mentoring programs um, provide um, diverse, integrated, and inclusive full participation experiences. Um, and then we'll, we'll wrap up the NDMC portion of this with a review of our recognition program and the Susan Daniels Disability Mentoring Hall of Fame. And finally, I'm going to give you a, a brief uh, introduction to some of our content that we share. And um, it, it's, a, it's a segment on networking. And it's something that I do when I'm out in, uh, with groups of young folks that are looking um, to find mentors and how to develop networks and turn those into asks for mentors. And I had the opportunity to do that yesterday. I thought I would share um, some of that curriculum with you as well. So with that, that's the overview of the agenda. Um, you know, we have the ability to, um, to have questions um, asked in the chat box, and uh, feel free to do that, and we will address them along the way. Um, one of the questions that has come up uh, says, will you advise what we should be seeing on the screen? I appreciate that um, point, and we'll do so as we go through the content, and I'll be providing some um, descriptions of what's on some, uh, the screen as well. So we're going to move now from the title page and to the first slide of the deck. Um, here's an image of a uh, African-American um, high school student, uh, wheelchair user, uh, and next to him is a deaf woman who is kneeling. And between the two is a face-to-face -face communicator for a hearing person to engage with a deaf person through uh, typing on a keyboard. Um, so uh, th th I'd like to begin today by highlighting that um, mentoring is important for uh, a variety of reasons. And we'll focus on disability mentoring, of course. However, in the United States, one in three youth grow up without a mentor. So let's just be clear about that. In your community, in your backyard and amongst your friends, one in three youth grow up without a mentor. And we have the resources to do something about that. Um, today, we're going to focus on disability mentoring, but I ask you and challenge you to think about how much time you spend in your own community providing mentorship to those in need. Uh, the resources are available, and what we need to do is create bridges between youth requiring mentorship and those with time to offer that mentorship. With that in mind, one in three youth without a mentor, we also need to examine research with youth with disabilities in regards to mentorship. And what's clear that the research indicates is that youth with disabilities, um, unlike individuals without disabilities, have low employment expectations. And part of that reason is, is they lack role models in their lives to drive higher employment expectations. The National Disability Mentoring Coalition, in effect, came together just over two years ago to address these two points, to change one in three youth to have a better ratio that more youth receive mentoring, and to help raise employment expectations for youth with disabilities in our country through increased access to role models, including role models with disabilities. On the next slide, we turn to the, ND, the NDMC mission and activities. So recognizing we have this twofold problem, 
we wanted to create the National Disability Mentoring Coalition in order to increase the awareness, quality, and impact of mentoring for individuals with disabilities across the nation. So when you think about that mission, for some of you across the country who've been tracking this work for a while, you may find that this sounds similar to something that's happened in the past. And in fact, in 2006, work was done by Partners for Youth with Disabilities headquartered in Boston uh, through funds coming from the Office of the Dis of Disability Employment Policy at the Department of Labor to create the National Disability Mentoring Council. Um, so in discovering that some of this work had been done before, some of us got together um, to readdress and start to build a framework to address today's problems and challenges in the mentoring industry. And so this is the rebirth of an effort um, with that, we, we found four areas or activities that would be our main focus in order to increase access to mentors for youth with disabilities. Connections was our driving force in order to bring the mentoring industry together. It was interesting to me when I stopped and started uh, and actually conducted an environmental scan in the country of how many different organizations were providing some form of mentoring to use with disabilities. Yet what happened was it was fragmented. So we wanted to bring those connections together to provide a professional network in order to expand mentoring opportunities. In effect, providing a network for mentoring professionals to learn best practices and share uh, common needs in order to pool resources as opposed to compete for those resources. So that's activity one. Activity two is the, the mentoring opportunity pipeline itself, where we provide training and technical assistance, but really as a referral network, where we get resources to the people in the communities. So if you are a person with a disability or their advocate or ally, when you stop and say, I wish I had a role model to help so and so access this information, or help them develop their personal vision for where they want to go and what they want to do next, we would have a resource pool available. I would ask you, where would you go to find a mentor? And if you're not sure, that's a common reaction for an individual. Just last week, I had somebody in Ohio email me saying that she is in graduate school and is on a professional track for employment, but with her uh, mental illness and the stress of the workload, she was having a hard time of positioning herself a year out in the employment sector and asked me, how do I find a mentor? Well, this is a common request that we hear all the time. And in that mentoring opportunity pipeline, we'd like to create a single point of access for individuals to be able to find that and we've started to build that at disabilitymentors.org. The third program area that we focus on is inclusion. I mentioned this briefly, facilitating mentoring experiences for people of all backgrounds and abilities. The mentoring industry is quite significant in our country. Programs like Big Brothers and Big Sisters, Girl Scouts, um, and the list goes on and on, are doing fabulous work in our communities across the country. Some of them have adopted inclusion, inclusive practices and, and implemented training programs to ensure both their um, staff under, have an understanding of the variety of disability and accommodations needed, but also so their digital presence would be accessible and inclusive experiences for all. We'll discuss that a little bit more as we get into the presentation. And then lastly, the recognition program, honoring excellence and highlighting people and programs that are really doing remarkable work in impacting the lives of youth with disabilities and adults with disabilities. So I will make one note here. Today's focus is on employment. Um, however, our members highlight both transition to employment and importantly, many members look at mentoring to improve community inclusion in general, not just focused 
on employment. So that's the mission and activities of the coalition. Again, if you're interested, you could go to our website, disabilitymentors.org, to learn more. Now let's dig into the actual connections themselves, and we're going to go through these four sectors. Um, when we started the program in December 2014, we had about 10 founding members of the, the Mentoring Coalition. Um, so uh, I'd like to recognize at this time the Mitsubishi Electric America Foundation and Policy Works to uh, a nonprofit organization and a foundation that helped provide seed money to begin the coalition. Um, we also had some other, um, I guess you would say some of the, the leading voices in, in the disability inclusion work around the country help us um, come together, including uh, USBLN, uh, the AAPD, um, and uh, some, some friends uh, at the National Council on Independent Living. And as we pulled them in as a national voice, we also looked to some of the, the leaders in the disability mentoring space, including Partners for Youth with Disabilities, I mentioned that of Boston, and the Institute for Educational Leadership, or IEL. Both have been doing fantastic work with mentoring for youth and or adults with disabilities uh, for years. So this, this group got together and really laid the groundwork that has since expanded to nearly 40 entities that are part of the coalition. And we expand not only from nonprofits and foundations, um, but we also um, hit up uh, with uh, government partners now. The city of Pittsburgh uh, was the first government entity to join the coalition. Um, and, and since we've done some partnership with the Department of Agriculture, um, we also have employers that are partners and Feral Gas um, joined us in order to help um, broaden their engagement strategy to reach uh, transitioning youth with disabilities. And uh, we have uh, academia, higher education is involved with our work as well um, with uh, Cornell University and uh, Florida Atlantic University, and importantly, an organization called DREAM that comes out of um, the Association for Higher Education and Disability um, and their National Center for College Students with Disabilities. So we have a variety of programs that represent a variety of mentoring services and models that exist in the country. And today, what we've done is selected several of those to dive into um, to highlight the, uh, how mentoring can impact transition from school to employment. Um, but before doing that, I'm going to turn to the next slide. And by the way, um, the slide connections to mentoring has about 35 logos on them of all of our members. Some of them I haven't mentioned. I ask you if you to, to read up on the members list to go to disabilitymentors.org and review the members list. Um, there's other organizations like the Viscardi Center, um, like Pearson um, Training, um, like Four Results Mentoring, the World Institute on Disability. There's a lot of programs out there. We don't have the time to go through all of these models today, but please re review those on the website if you're interested to see the full detailed list. So with these nearly 40 members in mind, we'll turn to the next slide and really talk about the variety of mentoring that exists. It's hard for me to gauge your understanding and awareness of the mentoring industry, so I'm going to suggest that we're more at a baseline level as opposed to experts and go through these to ensure that we all have an understanding of these models. So back in the day, a mentoring, as it grew from the Greek form, really stood for an older person to be mentoring a younger person. And so this model in a one-to-one -one match could be formalized. That is a very common program amongst our, mentor, our members and really useful in, uh, for um, providing a structured, goal-oriented mentorship program. It's well documented on paving the way to work through our partners at IAL and best practices in mentoring for disability organizations from Partners for Youth with Disabilities, how to structure a one-on-one -on -one mentor match program and achieve um, outcome-oriented mentoring. 
The next model down is also a familiar one, a group mentoring experience where you benefit from having the discussion with multiple people. Group mentoring, and sometimes now called uh, circle mentoring, allows for multiple individuals to benefit from a group dialogue. The third option in the mentoring models list is peer mentoring. And in recent time, let's say about the last four to five years, we've seen peer mentoring um, grow from not just a model that may be very familiar with our friends and partners at the Centers for Independent Living, but into other mentoring streams. Um, PolicyWorks, one of our founding members, has been providing peer mentoring at several locations around the country where the, uh, an individual is matched with a peer who has been provided training on how to be the mentor. But then in effect, each of these individuals has a chance to positively impact each other through the dialogue. Um, one of the peer models that works well is when a college student transitions out of college into the world of work and then immediately gives back to a current college student with a disability in a similar scenario that could benefit from their guidance about creating a vision of themselves in the world of work and then helping put the toolkit in play as their perhaps junior and senior year play out. That's the peer mentoring model. The fourth option on the list, authentic or natural mentoring, um, may seem a, a bit odd at first, but perhaps is the fastest growing mentoring model that we have, not only in the country, but as some of my friends have told me going on around the world. So authentic mentoring grows out of a, a, a natural relationship. And it's when two individuals um, through uh, standard communications find ways to support either one another or one person through that dialogue. There is no structured format. It's not a registration process, nor is there training involved, but the culture that the individuals are in support authentic mentoring and is encouraged Today, we see many uh, leading organizations developing, as employers leading organizations, um, leveraging natural or authentic mentoring as a key competitive uh, edge in the organization. We also see this occur in the disability community. The next model, e-mentoring, um, we have a variety of e-mentoring solutions. At times, we see platforms for e-mentoring, and that could be where individuals have a uh, two-way communication and there's oversight. So somebody would be watching the communication. Um, you could see in that platform that there would be activities to achieve on the platform itself, like let's say uh, resume creation or preparing for an interview, um, how to dress for success. And as the, those are achieved, the e-platform would symbolize progress by providing uh, some type of check mark for indicating the activities were done. There's also other forms of e-mentoring that are growing quickly as technology advances. Um, a common tool, of course, is email. Um, however, text-based e-mentoring is growing quickly as a form to increase Mentor and mentee compliance in the relationship might sound a little formal, but at times we might find ourselves attached to our mobile phones. And so there are some in certainly the mainstream sector that have found when mentors leverage text through apps or just through text to remind their mentees of an, of an engagement or uh, an activity that's required then the mentee is more apt to actually do that activity. In the next one down, situational mentoring, that's a, a bit of a short-term discussion. It can be between executives or leaders. Uh, in this case, if we export it to our use, you could have um, the focus be on a transitioning college age student on a high impact problem, like transitioning to employment, the uncertainty of it, um, the situational mentoring 
would uh, enhance an individual's or um, uh, the, the group potentially ability to hit the outcome they were desiring. So in this sense, when we're looking at career transition, how could we increase the employment outcome for nearly, you know, uh, 60%, perhaps 50 to 60% of college graduates with disabilities that never work. Well, situational mentoring would allow us to identify common occurrences in the transition from graduation to no employment and uh, leverage perhaps peer mentoring to infuse information about how to handle transition with benefits, how to seek employment from employers of choice, and how to be prepared when the interview comes. So that's what situational is. Uh, blended or modern is, uh, as it might sound, blended mentoring, a little bit of each. You could have some authentic relationships. You could be in a formal program or an e-program. Uh, but blended and, and modern mentoring seems to be uh, a, an approach that many individuals prefer. There's youth-initiated mentoring where um, somebody seeks out and the, the person that seeks the mentoring is obviously young, and they are initiating with either a like age or an older person, um, but they're driving the relationship. Um, so it's a pretty cool model that exists. Um, there is flash and speed, where flash is a one-time event where you have uh, obviously a, a quick experience. Um, speed mentoring is a is in a time controlled as well. Um, and then the last three here disability mentoring where we make sure that the mentor has a disability um, and becomes a role model with the disability that's obviously one that our coalition works with a lot uh, reverse mentoring where individuals can learn from each other it's really wonderful when we see models from our members where we have uh, individuals with disabilities um, different disabilities mentoring each other and there's reverse mentoring that occurs both about uh, um, the disability, but also obviously about their school or work experience. Um, I am currently being reverse mentored by several peers, and uh, many of them are younger than me. Uh, it's a it's a great tactic to understand different perspectives and to gain knowledge about how to um, approach uh, situations as you see at work. So. The last one here on the list, and I see a question came in, but let me address no M word included. Um, one of the things that to round out the mentoring models discussion is often we'll ask our groups that we get together, participants, especially young people, you know, are you aware of, or, you know, who are the mentors in your life? Or have you had a mentor? Or how would you ask for a mentor? And what we get is very little in return. I think what we've learned is that the M word can be a scary word and that mentoring doesn't need to be so formalized or mentoring maybe isn't always called mentoring. Um, we've seen different forms where people identify um, peer counseling, apprenticeship, uh, you hear about sponsorship models, uh, more perhaps in a corporate environment, um, and then certainly one of friendship and one of the leading mentoring models in the country, if not the world, is the best buddies model. And that's not based on true uh, mentoring, but it's more based on friendship and relationship building. So when we talk about mentoring, we like to say mentoring has these definitions, but sometimes don't be scared off by the M word. What we're looking for are role models to help individuals build confidence and help people develop individual personal visions for their future, and then be, in effect, so-called sounding boards to help individuals feel their way through that uh, strategic plan they've developed for themselves. So I, I have a question here from Evan. It says, is the best form of mentoring natural mentoring over the others? Um, thanks for the question, Evan. I, you know, I think it's a really personal answer. and. So certainly the idea of authentic or natural mentoring is critical. If we as um, leaders can create cultures where authentic mentor mentoring is 
encouraged, then our entire environment would be investing in each other. And so if we cared more about the development of each person, then we're more likely to help them attain their goals and then organizations more likely to improve their performance and outcomes. So I highly recommend that. That being said, when we focus on youth and youth with disabilities, um, considering um, transition to post-secondary education and then transition to employment, um, I would recommend that not only authentic mentoring be available in their lives, but potentially something more structured. You know, one of the ways to, to get youth with disabilities to consider being in a structured mentoring program may in effect be to have them be a mentor themselves. When I speak with participants, I often ask them, what do mentors do? And many of them are, don't know. And so what I ask them to do is to go back and find a program in their community that they could mentor somebody potentially younger than them and by going through that training program, then they would better understand what a mentor does and would be more apt to apply to a program such as a one-to-one -one or peer mentoring program. And I think from my experience in watching a lot of these programs, one-to-one -one and peer mentoring programs are really useful models for individuals that are considering transition from school to work. Thank you very much, Evan. I appreciate the question. So now I'm going to move to the next slide. We're on slide six. This is moving to resources and member programs. So now let's remember the coalition does four things. We are a network and we have a pipeline of resources. We have an inclusion effort and we have a recognition effort. So now we're moving into resources. And we're going to look at some, some specific member programs that represent different models, but also organizations that are focused on helping their individuals um, get feedback and with their challenges and with including developing their personal vision and then um, building blocks to uh, achieve that vision. So in the member programs on this slide, we have a list of about 12 different programs. I've mentioned most of these organizations when I provided our members list review. Um, on this slide, there's four that are the, our programs that are bolded. Each one of these we'll dig into in more detail. The last one being the USBLN or US Business Leadership Network Rising Leaders Mentoring Program, of which Anna is going to present that content. I'll go through the first three. Prior to getting to the bolded programs, I just wanted to note, one of the cool things about our 40 members is that we represent all the models, mentoring models, but we also represent an amazing spectrum of the disability community. And in that case, we really can touch through different models and different members the all, not just geographic representation of the country, but the amazing diversity of the disability community itself. An example is the Autistic Self Advocacy Network. They run a campus inclusion leadership academy where they have a mentoring program to help um, structure leaders on nationwide campuses to become self advocates. So here we're working with the autism community on campuses. Um, of course, that's going to lead to post-graduation transition to work as part of their self-advocacy efforts. The National Council on Independent Living Peer Support Mentoring and Counseling Program is a, an awesome national strategy for 403 SILs across the country to provide mentoring and counseling. That structure provides mentoring in most regional or communities. So here's a great opportunity if you're wondering, well, who's doing this work in my backyard? It's to go to Nichols' website and look up the SIL in your community and form a partnership with that mentoring program. Um, for results mentoring in the Portland, Oregon area has a mentoring program around wellness for individuals with uh, mental illness. Easter Seals has 72 affiliates across the, the nation providing mentoring. And they have this really great online community called Thrive, 
for young women with disabilities and in effect is an online peer support mentoring program. Um, I mentioned IEL before. Um, IEL operates the Ready to Achieve mentoring program in about 10 sites in eight states, although they'll be expanding. Uh, so the ramp is for uh, at-risk youth with disabilities to reduce recidivism rates. Um, and then the final two on this slide to highlight uh, Project Search, as many of you are familiar with Project Search, it's an internship program for individuals with developmental disabilities. They have a co-worker connection portion of their program that operates, which is so cool. So not only do they have the, the individuals excuse me, participating in Project Search have a supervisor, they also have a co-worker, and that connection is a, a peer mentor in that environment. Um, on the slide, it says in 44 plus states in DC, it's my understanding from our project search colleagues that they will be in all 50 states by the end of the year, which is just around the corner. So congratulations to project search and the amazing work that they're doing. Um, and last but not least on this slide, Partners for Youth with Disabilities. Um, they run a variety of mentoring programs, including a one-to-one -one mentor match that program was developed in 1985. So I'll say that again. That program was developed in 1985. They've been operating Mentor Match in Boston for 31 years. And they've obviously expanded in that time and provide other mentoring programs. But they're impacting the lives of thousands of individuals in Boston and through their inclusion and in e-mentoring program reaching others across the country as well. So it gives you a sample of the different populations mentoring uh, programs that are members of the coalition are reaching. But I'd like to dig in deeper now to our four resources to highlight. The first of those is the American Association of People with Disabilities. So founded in 1999, Disability Mentoring Day uh, is a large scale effort that many, many of you are familiar with. And it's coordinated by APD um, that came out of the White House. And it's a really a career development opportunity. These single day experiences drive um, through shadowing and discussion or speed mentoring an opportunity to find out what's available for work. So if you're in school and you're starting to consider a transition to work, you can explore these opportunities. Mentoring Day is the third Wednesday in each October, and perhaps some of you participated. I've seen in the news recently articles out of New Jersey where Novartis held their Disability Mentoring Day for a large number of youth to explore the pharmaceutical industry. Um, AAPD has um, three uh, pilots going on and, and, uh, that will look to how do you drive further transition from a shadowing experience into perhaps a internship experience or from that internship experience then into full-time employment. They're working on that now. Uh, think through their, their partnership with uh, Nickel. They will have a report out in spring that is to be an online toolkit to help other organizations model the disability mentoring to transition pipeline. So that's the AAPD. And really thanks to them for their ability to get the word out about mentoring. Perhaps some of you received an invitation to RSVP for this very event through AAPD's awesome communications network. Um, what we have uh, is, uh, on the next slide is a completely different model. So you have a one day experience to drive awareness uh, for um, mentees to think about employment, but Certainly the reverse mentoring that goes on on Disability Mentoring Day is fabulous. We're an organization that doesn't have as much awareness to people or interaction to people with disabilities suddenly um, learns and gains that benefit from the diversity. Th this next model, however, from the Christopher and Dana Reeve Foundation is a completely different approach um, than a single day model. The peer and family support program at the Reeve Foundation is a national peer-to-peer -peer mentoring program that provides support and information um, to people living with paralysis and their family members or caregivers. 
So this model is pretty cool. The Reef Foundation knows that peer mentors make a significant difference for an individual who acquires paralysis. And they have 500 peer mentors located in 30 states. And these uh, mentors go through different certification trainings. Um, and they've had 7,000 encounters now um, between these mentors and the 3,500 peers that are in their system. So you can learn more about the Reed Foundation model at uh, ChristopherReed.org. There's a full link on this slide as well. I think what, what happens here is that their model is about community inclusion, knowing that the first thing that we have to do when somebody acquires paralysis is to make sure that they can find uh, a transition and supports to a new way of living. Once they get to that destination, though, the peer mentoring model continues to, and then turns to a focus, of course, to include employment as well. So we appreciate the partnership with the Reeve Foundation and their model for providing peer mentorship. And um, that's our second model for a detailed review. Next, on the next slide, I'd like to highlight the broad futures model. Um, so we had a national model with AAPD uh, and Mentoring Day and a national model with the Reeve Foundation. Um, with Broad Futures, it's a nonprofit organization located in the uh, Washington, D.C. National Capital Region. Uh, Broad Futures is a cool uh, model that's focused on individuals with learning disabilities and attention deficit disorders. Um, they, they provide training and embedded mentoring through a paid internship experience. So what happens is, and I've had the opportunity to visit their classes, there's a two week initial training and then a, a follow on session every Friday once their internship starts. But what the training is, is it, it incorporates workforce preparedness and effective communication. And they do it through a tolerance building, stress reducing model that really looks to what are um, tools and coping mechanisms in order to control stress and focus on communication. Um, so Broad Futures as a member of the coalition has, uh, has provided three programs, and I think they're in the fourth now, but it's a very holistic curriculum and it's delivered through some uh, creative approaches using drama, speech pathology, and they bring in workforce experts who can become role models through those presentations. Um, one of the key things, of course, that they do is mentoring and they'll bring back a mentor from a previous cohort to talk to and, of course, be a, a reach out, somebody that a participant can talk to during their program. Uh, and that peer mentor really provides a, an added bonus for success. Um, They've served directly um, through the program, 34 interns, and they've had eight peer mentors. And um, what they're seeing is that more than half of the interns were offered ongoing work from an organization that was only putting out a, an internship. So we're seeing that the confidence is being improved, and we're seeing that the employers like the communication and skills that they're receiving through the internship, and 50% of them are receiving full-time job opportunities. The importance here to recognize is that these students with learning disabilities uh, have had challenges. They may have stopped school, uh, meaning college. Um, they, they may uh, have stopped thinking about wanting to go back, and yet through this internship with embedded mentoring, they have new confidence, and they're getting back on an employment track. So that's the third model that I wanted to share with you today. It's a, a community-based at this time approach uh, from a small nonprofit that was filling a need and saw the importance of embedding mentoring to help drive uh, role model stories to mentees. So we're, at that point, I'm gonna turn now from slide nine to slide 10. And as I previewed before, we're going to use this opportunity to introduce Anna Cunningham. Anna is a manufacturing analyst. Philip introduced her before. 
um, with Northrop Grumman Corporation, and she has been a participant in the USBON um, Rising Leaders Mentoring Program. Uh, she's going to talk to you now about her experience in that program, and I'll turn it over to you, Anna. Hi, Derek. Thanks for the uh, thanks for the introduction. So I'm going to talk a little bit today about my experience in the Rising Leaders Mentoring Program, both as a mentee and a mentor, and how that transitioned into my current job at Northrop Grumman. So if you want to go to the next slide, Derek. Um, the U.S. Beyond Rising Leaders Mentoring Program originally started as the Career Link Mentoring Program. I believe it started in 2013. Uh, I was their second class in 2014, and they connected me um, with a Northrop Grumman professional. His name is Dan Ellerman, and he's um, a Director of Diversity and Inclusion. So not a lot to do with what, what I did in school. I, I majored in economics and international studies, and I also studied French and finance. However, they, um, they knew he wanted to work with someone on the business side of things, so they made that connection. Uh, the relationship actually worked out really well. I, uh, at the time, I lived in Ohio, but I was moving to D.C. for an internship. So in the beginning, we did what you might call e-mentoring, where we would talk on the phone. Uh, I don't believe we Skyped, but we did you know, just, just talking and texting and working on things that way. And in, we started the mentoring relationship in May, and in June I went to D.C. to meet him, and we just kind of talked in person and discussed what we both wanted from the mentoring, mentee mentor experience. Uh, and at first we weren't really sure where to take it because neither of us had done it in this format before. Uh, however, we quickly figured out that it was going to be a pretty – easy flowing relationship and experience. Uh, we did a lot of different activities regarding professional development. We, um, we worked on my resume because while I had an internship lined up for the summer at the Pentagon, I didn't have full-time employment yet. And I still had a resume from when I was in college that my career center had worked on with me. And I quickly learned that that's very different than what you have in the professional world. So Dan, as well as some of his colleagues, has helped me edit my resume and um, add and remove content and reformat, which helped me a lot. And I used that to actually apply for jobs at Northrop Grumman. Um, and through his help and networking with other people within the company, through him, uh, I was actually able to be hired uh, by Northrop Grumman. And I had the job offer before I had even gone to the completion of the mentoring program, which usually is added with the USBLN annual conference. So by the time the conference had come around, I had secured em employment and successfully completed the program. Um, some other things that we did while mentoring, um, Dan took me to workshops and conferences. Um, the workshops he took me to were usually regarding discipline inclusion or diversity, in diversity and inclusion. And they were often panels with professionals in, in government and in the private sector uh, talking about various topics and on how to be inclusive and so on. So events similar to this. Um, he also was able to invite me to larger conferences, such as the NILG, um, which were in, in D.C. And I was able to meet people he worked with and go to seminars and breakout sessions and so on and learn from those. So uh, at, in the beginning of the mentoring program, Dan had actually said to me, well, I don't know what I'm going to do for you because you seem so professionally developed, which isn't to say anything about me, but it was interesting because we didn't exactly have an approach to it, but we quickly learned that the best thing to do would really be to work on networking and just giving me professional experience in that way because up until that point, I'd only had internships and a school experience, so I didn't necessarily have full-time professional experience networking with people um, beyond my education and beyond the internships. So that was actually very helpful to me. And through networking, I was able to build other relationships. That, and I still am in contact with these people today, and they've opened up different opportunities for me. Uh, for example, in, at Northrop Grumman, I started out in the professional development program. And uh, I'm lucky enough to have uh, many mentors at different levels within the company, all the way up to AVPGM, who meets with me on um, 
probably a, a semi-annual basis. So she gives me guidance and so on, which is a huge opportunity for me considering that there are uh, around 70,000 people in my company. So I've, I've really been offered some opportunities that are not typical um, to starting professionals within the company. Um, and because of the program I entered, I've also been able to go between different jobs. So as Philip mentioned, I started out in proposals and I moved on to HR and business operations. Those were all part of the program I joined, but every step of the way, Dan continued to mentor me and give me advice on how to navigate political situations and where to go next and what I should do and how I should handle different situations. Um, and while the Rising Leaders Mentoring Program is only a, I believe it's six months, it starts in the spring and it ends in the fall, um, it's a short program. However, they encourage their mentors to continue to work with the mentees, uh, which, which Dan has done and to this day I, we still talk. Um, there's also a link here at the bottom. We can we can watch that now. It shows Dan and I um, representing Northrop Grumman and the USBLN in their 2014 PSA. Derek, are you able to open it up? Yeah, it's showing now. Okay, thanks. And the video is now over. So just in case anyone wondered about the silence, that was about 31 seconds of a public service announcement showing Anna Cunningham, who's speaking with you, and her mentor, Dan Ellerman. Anna, back to you. Thank you, Derek. So now I'll talk a little bit about the USPLN Annual Conference, which I mentioned briefly. Uh, at the end of the mentoring program every year in the fall is the USPLN Conference. And um, every year has been increasing in size and attendees. Um, Derek and I have gone the last three years. The first year I went in 2014, I was still in the mentoring program. So I went supported by the USBLN. And while I was there, I was able to network and go to plenary sessions and breakout sessions. And I actually um, was able to speak in some different sessions and things like that. And the PSA that you all just watched was aired that year because it, it was the um, the organization's main PSA for that year, and I believe it still is actually the one they use. Uh, so that event was was huge for me in professional development because it was the first time I had attended a conference in full length as a professional, or a new professional. I was starting at Northrop in about a month or two after that. Um, However, since then, I've been to the conference twice, and I've actually gained a lot more experiences there. Uh, the last two years I've gone uh, as a Northrop Grumman representative, and last year I was given the opportunity to um, moderate the closing plenary session where I um, introduced panelists and you know, asked questions and discussed what was kind of followed up on what was being discussed. That was a very large opportunity for me, which I was very thankful for. And this year, I was able to speak in some more events. Um, similar to this speech, I talked about the Rising Leaders Mentoring Program and my experience um, being a mentee and transitioning into a mentor. And I also discussed uh, what mentoring and disability inclusion means to me. Um, in doing that, I was representing Northrop Grumman and other um, DEI top 100 scores. Um, and uh, if we go to the next slide, uh, I'll talk a little bit about being a USBLN mentor. Um, Anna, I'm sorry to do this, but I want to quickly interrupt you because I think you're entirely too modest. Um, I was at USBLN in 2015 and 2016, and when Anna says she spoke to a session. She was in front of hundreds of people talking about her experiences. So um, I, she has provided some really valuable insights to a lot of people, and I think is a really um, a really outstanding leader in our community. So sorry to interrupt, but I just wanted to plug that little piece of knowledge. So please keep up the good work. Well, thank you very much. I uh, I try my best, and I really 
enjoyed speaking on this topic um, here and in other, um, in other webinars and at the conference. So I hope to continue doing it. Um, but this year I was, I was lucky, enough, lucky enough to be invited to mentor um, in, the Rising Leader, in the Rising Leaders Mentoring Program since I had um, been a mentee before and had since gained professional experience. Going into this, I was a little nervous because I thought, well, I'm only 24. I've only been a professional for two years. Um, and a lot of these mentees have more experience than me in, in different areas. So going into it, I didn't really know what to expect. They paired me with a engineering PhD student at University of Pittsburgh. So again, the fear of, you know, I was younger than him. Um, he's a PhD student who's so further along in that regard. I wasn't really sure how I was going to mentor and what, what exactly I would be doing or what role I would be able to provide. However, I quickly learned that um, I had a lot to offer and he had a lot to offer me as well. So I brought in the perspective of being a professional and having a career. Since he is a PhD student, he has not yet had a job. He's gone straight from undergrad to, to um, graduate school. So I was able to help him editing his resume, taking it from an academic resume to a um, professional or um, corporate focused resume. Um, we also spent a lot of time talking about mentoring and professionalism. And there were some, some blips along the way uh, regarding um, what I might say is um, lack of, um, let me lack of participation or lack of um, gratitude, not gratitude, but you know, um, dedication to the program and showing that you're in it and that you want to learn from it. And so we discussed things like that and quickly made progress. And we actually were able to meet at the, the conference this year and still talk to this day. Um, but I really enjoy being a mentor in the program and I have signed up to do it again this year. And I think it was a very valuable lesson for me because I learned that um, you don't have to necessarily be older or anything like that to be a mentor. You can provide advice and guidance to people that are in different stages of their career and in different ways. Um, and also a large aspect of the mentoring program I found out was um, confidence and handling the, um, the aspect of disability disclosure and um, awareness in the workplace, which I hadn't actually thought too much about before because I had never had issues with accommodations or disability disclosure. So I helped guide him in that and understand what was acceptable and what was not and how those situations could be handled and dealt with going into the workforce. Um, that's all I have, so uh, I'm going to pass it back to Derek to discuss inclusion. Anna, thank you very much. That was awesome. Um, I think the point that you bring up at the end, I want to make sure is, is heard because the USBLN model really does uh, disclosure training um, and some, some other supports for both mentees and mentors um, and, and really cool proven best practice models. Um, and, you know, a shout out to my friend Joe Strache that USBLN partners with, but the disclosure work that he does with the mentees not only is through a group call that they provide, but um, at times one-on-one. -on -one. So thanks for, for saying that. I'll also note and we'll have some open Q and A at the end here, but I'll just, you know, foot stomp here a little bit of Philip's um, point about Anna. I mean, Anna is wise beyond her years, right? Um, but also, so is Northrop Grumman. So clearly, they leverage the a mentoring program to identify um, talent. And here, that was Anna, and now she's working for Northrop Grumman. Northrop Grumman's lucky to have her. We would all be lucky to have Anna on our team. So if you have questions um, for Anna or me, we'll, we'll definitely have another chance um, to, to open up to those towards the end. Um, meanwhile, feel free to use the Q&A chat feature and we'll address those. Um, so we looked at four different models. 
we had AAPD with the Shadow Day, and, and then we had we uh, the uh, Broad Futures and Leave models, and then the USBLN Rising Leaders Program, Rising Leaders Mentoring Program. Now we'll turn to our inclusion work. Uh, so the Mentoring Coalition, as I mentioned before, wants to have a dual strategy, disability mentoring with some type of one-on-one -on -one or group match experience, but also to try to change and build a more inclusive mainstream mentoring models. To do that, we practice or, or partner, excuse me, with Mentor, the National Mentoring Partnership. Um, you can learn more about Mentor at mentoring.org. Um, Mentor's mission is to fuel the quality and quantity of mentoring relationship uh, for America's young people and to close what they've labeled as the mentoring gap for that one in three young people growing up without critical support and role models. So when we work with Mentor uh, as a group of 40 disability mentoring organizations, we do that to help close the gap of one in three young people as well as build inclusive practices. How do we do that? Through a variety of ways. Um, so the mentor model is an interesting one. It's an, uh, a national uh, affiliate relationship, in some ways similar to the USBLN affiliate model, if you're familiar with that. So there's a state mentoring partnership, like Illinois Mentoring, uh, Virginia Mentorship Partnership, and they have run their own relationships and mentoring programs in those states. And then those state affiliates connect together to form a national network. That's what Mentor fuels with um, best practices, training and technical assistance tools, along with advocacy. And advocacy can include um, things like um, advocacy for funding on Capitol Hill in Washington. The second bullet on this slide under the mentoring partnership is mentoring connector. We're going to look at that a little bit more closely on the next slide. Um, so, but let me also mention the National Mentoring Resource Center is available. It's funded through the Office of Juvenile uh, Justice Delinquency Program um, at the Department of Justice. But if you're interested in mainstream mentoring work, you can look at that resource center online. Um, like I said, they do provide um, national webinars and have a lot of materials online, including materials for National Mentoring Month. So visit them, mentor at mentoring.org. We certainly appreciate the support from their team, including uh, David Shapiro, their CEO, and Elizabeth Santiago, their, the member representative to our Disability Coalition. The next slide entitled Mentoring Connector Search, slide 15. This has a graphic from the Mentoring Connector search page itself. To view this online, you can go to mentoring.org and go to the Mentoring Connector to search for a local mentoring program. I'll describe the page, but in effect, it's a form field that asks for your first and last name. On the slide on the screen, I've typed in first name Derek, last name Shields. There's an email address, and then I typed in a zip code, 22042, just so you know that zip code is Falls Church, Virginia. And I put in a distance. You have the option of 5, 10, 15, or 25 miles. And I selected 25 miles. Um, in this mentoring connector search, I'm looking for a specific youth population to be served and that I've selected youth with disabilities. There's a variety of options there, but just so you know, one is youth with disabilities. The next one down is age of youth served. Um, there are younger programs, but I've selected 15 to 18. And then the type of mentoring, I'm seeking a one-to-one -one mentor match program. So after entering that information at this website, you can then hit search by selecting search I will click to the next slide, and we have Mentoring Connector results. On this page, we see a website with a, um, navigational options at the top, why mentoring, get involved, program resources, along with the mentor logo. Below that, there are two results that have been found, and it says for these two programs, um, it's hard to read, but it's uh, the program name is uh, what appears to be Robin's Trailblazers, and then the second program is 
Teens Run DC. Um, next to these two links to the program is a map that appears much like Google Maps. Um, it's a map of the uh, Washington DC National Capital Region with a 25 mile diameter around the search area. And you can see that the two target programs, one being just outside of, or inside, I'm sorry, the Washington Beltway, and the other one is out a highway to the west of Washington, D.C. This is how somebody can find a program that's tailored for serving youth with disabilities. Um, we're working with Mentor to ensure our members all provide their resources into the Mentoring Connector, along with providing our own um, central uh, portal to mentoring programs at disabilitymentors.org. I wanted to share that with you in case this would be of use to you and your organizations to find out who might be providing mentoring programs in your backyard. Um, you could also enter e-mentoring to try to find a solution that may not be in your backyard but is available in the nation as uh, one of the service uh, selections in the mentor search queue. So you can check that out at mentoring.org. And if you have any ideas about the search and how we could help mentor make that a more inclusive experience, please feel free to, to email me. And on the next slide, this slide is 17 and it's titled 2017 National Mentoring Month. Um, here we participate in the National uh, Mentoring Month for the 15th year in 2017. Um, one of the things that we've done as a disability mentoring coalition is to partner with Mentor to increase um, the appearance of youth with disabilities. Um, they, uh, as our partner, identify that it was hard for them at times to find authentic images. And so um, in this picture, you see the graphic, the uh, picture that I described early on with the um, young African-American male wheelchair user and the deaf woman kneeling next to him. They're using that as a treatment in their National Mentoring Month campaign. January is National Mentoring Month. The president signs a proclamation each January recognizing the month, and it is a time to celebrate the importance of mentoring, to amplify the message, to increase uh, mentoring volunteers in the nation. And as a partner with Mentor, the coalition supports that work, and we'll be doing some specific activities this January. We look for you all to participate. Um, you see um, In Real Life is their campaign theme, and hashtag mentor IL, IRL sorry, um, is a, a campaign hashtag. We'll be doing some hashtag disability mentors activities. I'm excited to um, share that um, the uh, Department of Labor and AAPD have asked us to do a, a national Twitter chat on January 12th, which is Thank Your Mentor Day. And uh, I'll be hosting that and we'll be using hashtag disability mentors. Um, and then later in the month on Ed Roberts Day, which is January 23rd, um, the Disability Mentoring Coalition will be partnering with um, YO, Youth Organizing Disabled and Proud out of California, and with our friends at uh, NICL, National Council on Independent Living, and the Youth Transition Fellow um, to have an Ed Roberts Day chat with the youth in America, youth with disabilities, to talk about what they view as mentoring and their mentoring needs going forward. Again, that will be January 23rd. So keep your eyes and ears and uh, email boxes open for National Mentoring Month activities. Our last program area is the uh, recognition program. We have the Susan Daniels Disability Mentoring Hall of Fame. So on slide 18, we provide some background content and there's a picture of Susan and if some of you knew Susan. Um, she often wore a red hat. She was quite one uh, for the dressing. But, uh, the, the recognition program honors Susan as one of the disability community's admired leaders whose passion was to connect young people with disabilities to meaningful careers through mentoring. And Susan was the epitome of an authentic mentor. She just built it into everything she did. Uh, and I had the opportunity to know and work with Susan, and Susan was my mentor. Um, we created the Hall of Fame 
and, and inducted the first class in September 2015, inducting 25 individuals in honor of the first 25 years of the Americans with Disabilities Act. In January of 2016, we opened uh, the Hall of Fame nominations to a public platform and accepted those and then inducted that class in um, June. And then through July until just this past November, we held seven events around the country to have in-person induction ceremonies to recognize leaders in mentoring and mentoring program models. Uh, we will intend to uh, open up the nomination platform in January for the class of 2017. And you can visit the Hall of Fame at disabilitymentors.org in order to learn more. The next slide highlights the first half of the class of 2016 inductees. If you want to read up on profiles of each of these individuals, please go to disabilitymentors.org and look for the Hall of Fame class of 2016 navigation. Um, these individuals, um, I'll read three of their names on this slide to give you a sample. Uh, Daniel Davis from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, uh, Claudia Gordon from the U.S. Department of Labor, and Matthew McCullough from the District of Columbia DD Council. Each one of those three is in the picture with a certificate during their induction ceremony at the AAPD, um, AA, ADA Gala in July this past year. On the next slide, we'll see the, the balance of the 2016 inductees to include um, Regina Snowden from Partners for Youth with Disabilities, Bob Viteri from North of Grumman as our mentor of the year, and also Kathy Petoskis from Work Without Limits at UMass Medical School. There's others, look at them at disabilitymentors.org. Importantly, we recognize best practices and mentoring programs as well, and this year inducted Eye to Eye as our national program of the year. Eye to Eye provides a peer mentor as an older uh, college uh, graduate that comes, uh, a college student that comes back into their community through a high school program to provide mentoring while doing art projects. Eye to Eye is a rapidly growing organization with a successful mentoring model. We also recognized Massachusetts Commission for the Blind, Partners for Youth with Disabilities, and an amazing model of inclusion at Vanderbilt University through their Next Steps Ambassador Program, where multiple Vanderbilt students are mentors to create an inclusive experience for education, recreation, and uh, balanced college living at Vanderbilt's campus. So we recognize those individuals and programs this year, and we look forward to receiving your nominations from around the country to recognize best practices in 2017. The next slide that I have up is from the Nickel Conference, just to show you we do these induction ceremonies and we have a little fun in recognizing people, but here's a picture of myself on the left and Kings Floyd from Nickel on the right. We're also in the upper corner um, with um, three certificates being held with uh, four winners. There's three young people, including a woman in a chair. Um, they represent Christina Mills from California. Um, she wasn't able to come, but some youth received it. And then Daniel Davis is in the middle, Matt McCullough next to him, and then Donna Meltzler from the National Association of the Councils on uh, Developmental Disabilities. That's uh, the nickel ceremony I just wanted to show you. Uh, we have a little fun. Um, this, this last slide, um, of the NDMC overview provides the goals that we're looking for, uh, forward to working on in 2017 and beyond. And we would love your participation. We wanna increase the quality and qu quantity of mentors, develop the mentoring opportunity pipeline that I've described, continue to promote inclusion, create an evaluation team to discover through research what really works in disability mentoring, develop and disseminate standards for quality mentoring. Some of these exist through best practices and mentoring already. Promote and coordinate research into the impact of mentoring. Establish a disability mentoring policy agenda to help advocate at the federal, state, and local levels. 
and of course, continue to recognize best practices and people through the Susan Daniels Disability Mentoring Hall of Fame. So as I've said, uh, that was the coalition's overview. And I also wanted to provide in a short order, a sample of some of the content that we provide and have a little fun in doing that. So we got together often with a group of young people and we like to provide tailored content to them. So up on the slide now is slide 23 and there's 12 pictures of me when I was young. And to give you a sample of the content, what we like to do is in our networking and mentoring workshops, is to talk about how to uh, manage and create and manage a network and also ask for a mentor. In doing that, um, I'd like to kid myself a little bit here, but I'll hit the advance button and say, nobody taught me how to network. And then these pictures of me as a baby, there's one of me with headphones on. So clearly my parents as my first role models taught me how to listen to music. There's one of me riding a big wheel so clearly somebody taught me how you know, to drive. Um, there's one of me napping and somebody clearly taught me how to nap. And as my wife says, I'm still pretty good at that one. Um, and then there's one here of me eating and I'm a mess. So somebody helped me learn how to eat. And there's even one I've covered up a little bit, but yeah, somebody taught me um, how to be potty trained. But in the end, nobody taught me how to network. And what we like to do is to talk to um, our rising leaders about the importance of networking and come up with a, a four game uh, solution to it. So the first section that we talk about is the pregame. And I'll go through with our students or uh, rising professionals, how to develop a, uh, an elevator pitch, resume preparation, um, social media, gotta clean it up now before others get a view of it how to set relationship goals to earn connections, do pre-work, and make sure that you arrive early for your meetings. So we do the pre-game, and then on the next segment, we do a mind game. And a communications professor I had, had uh, back in uh, 1998 uh, from the University of San Francisco taught me had uh, four tools of the creative hero. And we'll take um, our participants through the mind game. Have faith in your own voice. Suspend negative judgment, practice precise observation, and ask penetrating questions. But in effect, using these tools to have confidence in oneself in order to then communicate your story. So we do the pregame and then we do the mind game. And then in that mind game, talk about courage. And that when you're networking and when you're meeting with a mentor, that this is at the root is really all about courage. And if we could elevate our use courage through building their self-confidence, then we're going to be able to get them to attempt things that they might not have tried before. And leveraging networks and positive influences in networks and mentors to do that will allow people to have the courage to create the next version of themselves. So having the personal vision and then the courage to develop that vision is really what this model is all about. So on the slide that I have up right now, it's the word courage on a brass plaque with the braille letters underneath each printed letter. This comes from a wall from the FDR Memorial in Washington, DC. After the pregame and the mind game, then we go into phase three, and that's showtime when you're actually networking, where we set relationship goals. The pre-work is happening. You arrive early. You have the interviews. We also suggest getting other experience in parallel networks through clubs or internships, and, of course, working at every chance you get. Our friends at the National Youth Transition Collaborative have the work early, work often campaign. And we integrate that thinking and mindset into the networking model that the best way to get your, your next job is to have a job and to network through those internships or um, jobs. Um, we encourage listening for challenges where how can we help others by helping them uh, with solutions. 
And at this point, we also start to say for this era that social media is critical. And as one of my friends recommends, to be a boss. If you're going to get involved with social media, be a boss and get 3,000 followers and show your prospective employers you know how to network and you can do that in the digital age as well. And then the last phase of the networking um, four parts is over time. And that's once you're past the networking experience, how to stay in touch and how to take a connection that you've met and potentially turn it into a LinkedIn connection, uh, making sure that you're saying thank you and you're having multiple follow-ups to nurture the relationship. So we take individuals through the networking model and then we turn that into a mentoring discussion. And in this mentoring model, you know, coming out of the network, we ask them to figure out how to develop a relationship with an individual that they aspire to learn from that will help them push forward in their model, that will work with them on a rating system to know what, what is success and am I, working, am I working towards that success. We talk to the youth about owning the mentoring model and the mentorship relationship, and that we can also give back to our community. We ask them to have respect in all their relationships, to have fun in doing that, to enjoy it, and to be honest and sincere. But at the end of the day, to also seize the day because their path to their personal vision will afford them progress. And when we look to make progress through mentorship, we also look to keep moving forward. And in this notion of moving forward, we do identify that we are in the middle of a civil rights movement and that their path is part of a long struggle that we all need to work towards. And so now I put up on the slide a picture of Martin Luther King Jr. And we bring this in that says, as part of the human condition, we wanna make progress and it doesn't matter how we get there. And as I quote Martin Luther King, if you can't fly, then run. And if you can't run, then walk, and if you can't walk, then crawl. But whatever you do, you have to keep moving forward. And we apply that to networking, to mentoring, for transition to employment. Because if we don't help individuals with disabilities succeed in transition from school to employment, then we're not fully realizing the intentions of our civil rights movement. With that, I appreciate your time today for hearing our story. Um, the Disability Mentoring Coalition, along with our networking pitch, um, there is now up on the screen. Um, I ask you if you're on Twitter to follow us on Twitter. We have about a thousand followers of what I call the Disability Mentors Network. We're at Dis Mentors. Again, at Dis Mentors. We provide information from our member programs and mainstream mentoring along with information on individuals doing great work in mentoring. Um, you could also follow us on Medium. Um, we have a blog called Disability Mentors. Again, on Medium, Disability Mentors. You can see two images here, one from our first blog by Jason Olson, Keep the Streets of Mentoring Open. Um, we also have other event type posts through there. Um, and last but not least, I really appreciate Anna's time today as my co-presenter and telling you a story that's probably more important than all the other content I shared because she's proof that it works. But uh, Anna is not only a, a member of USBLN and Northrop Grumman, but I consider her my friend. And here's a picture of Anna and I at the USBLN conference this past September in Orlando. My email address is dshields at forwardworks.net. And Anna's is anna.cunningham at ngc.com. With that, I'll turn this back to Philip. Thank you so much, Derek and Anna. That was a really wonderful presentation. We have a few minutes for questions and for the uh, to help me facilitate the Q&A, I'm actually um, roping in one of my public policy fellows, uh, um, Matt Wagner. Um, Matt, we have some questions, but I, first we have a question in the chat box. If there's anybody who um, has a question they're burning to ask any of our presenters, please use the chat box at the bottom left. Um, 
So, um, Matt, do you want to read off our first question? Sure. So, um, this is, uh, do you want to do the name? Or? Yeah. The oh, name. yeah. So, um, Val Cooks asks, um, I know an artist, a painter, who is looking for a professional artist to mentor him. Would a mentor, would the mentor connector help me find that type of mentor? Hey, thanks, Val, for that question. I, I see it in the chat, but I appreciate Matt uh, reading that for us. Uh, so, no, I, you know, I highly doubt that the mentor connector would provide that type of relationship match. I mean, I've never tried it, so we could try it. But um, what I'd like to do is if we could get that submitted to me and I can get your email, I could provide that to our members to see if I could find a, a relationship match through one of the programs. But this is the exact type of example that we believe we need a mentoring portal to mentoring programs for individuals with disabilities to find mentor matches. Um, but that's a great question. I'll be glad to follow up with you on that. Artists is um, kind of a broad definition. I think we have some, some digital um, graphic type artists that I can think of but um, actual old school painters, I don't know about. Hopefully, it, I, will, I will work through um, respectability to, to try to get in touch with you, Val. I'll make sure to follow up with you um, as well. Thank you. Um, Matt, do you have our next question? Yeah, certainly. So um, my focus actually is in cultural institutions, nonprofits, and they're always focused on trying to help um, better the lives of a lot of people, and they've been doing a lot of disability outreach. And I noticed that um, one of you things you talk about is paid internship. How do, um, do you have any suggestions on how to fund paid internships for relationships like this? Thanks for the question. I, I think it's a really great <laughs> question, right? There are a couple of strategies that I could suggest. Um, you could go out through foundations and um, some approaches that you use, but you might be um, in effect going after funding sources that you've already tapped for other programs. Um, the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, or WIOA, has set aside 15% of the funds in each state for pre-employment transition services. So I'll say that again. The work, WIOA has set aside 15% of funds for pre-employment transition services. That, those fundings, which you have to get through your state workforce system, are available for mentoring. But the mentoring has to drive employment pipeline work. That funding hasn't existed before, so it wouldn't be basically you know, going after a funding pool that you use for something else. Um, but uh, it's also new. So in each state is just implementing these strategies. So you would need to be able to connect with the state workforce board. Again, the mentoring funds would have to be, uh, you know, like if you created the paid internship model, you'd have to use this as a, a pre-employment transition service. So you'd have to perhaps braid that funding with some other funding that could in effect pay the interns and that might come from the employer themselves. So the employer would be the, pay, the payer of the, the income to the intern, but the actual training support services could be paid for through Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act dollars. The other Wonderful. recommendation, so yeah, the other recommendation is through ESSA, or Every Student Succeeds Act. Inside of ESSA, there's funding for mentoring there, there's approval for using funding for mentoring. Again, that would be through your state resources as the federal government sends that money from the federal budget to your state budget. Those are two ideas. Our coalition is working on providing some training content on that, so we would help you uh, with specific models. But those are two new ideas for you. Gotcha. Thank you so much, Derek. And um, two points to follow on with that is that if there are anybody in today's webinar with particular expertise or connections in the New York City or Los Angeles area, um, hit me up with an email at philip p at respectabilityusa.org. Um, we're looking at building some new communities of practice to really advance opportunities and combat stigma. 
So, um, and I'm glad you brought up WIOA. Um, Derek, um, if there are anybody who wants to get connected to their local and state workforce boards, I have pretty much every WIOA contact in the nation in my um, hard drive at some point. So, um, we've been pushing hard around disability employment opportunities through WIOA. So, Thank you so much for bringing that up. Um, I'm going to quickly switch and just touch on a few other items as we wrap up today's webinar. Um, I'm switching the slide deck to talk about um, how we talked about mentoring as one of the many things that we need um, as our nation looks at the criminal justice system. We particularly think that um, there's a real need for mentorship programs to support returning citizens, particularly those with disabilities, as they seek to reintegrate into society. Um, and I would encourage you to look at that particular section of our big criminal justice report. Additionally, I want to extend a huge thank you to J.P. Morgan Chase and Company for supporting our work, supporting the work of many other accessibility and disability initiatives. Without their support, we would not be able to offer you these free webinars with captioning. Um, they really enabled us to really kind of provide a lot of content to a lot of folks in a lot of different areas. And thank you so much, Chase, for your hard work and support for the disability community. Um, the next, this is actually our last webinar for the year. Um, we've got some poll releases coming out, some big announcements, um, and I would invite everybody who's with us today to look ahead to Tuesday, January 17th. We're going to be joined by um, Timothy Shriver and a few other folks from Special Olympics, and we're going to be talking about what they've been doing around training police and um, people with disabilities. As many of you may have seen from the Jay Ruderman Family Foundation report, from one-third to one-half of police use of force incidents involve a person with a disability. It is a significant problem that impacts our community, that impacts other minority communities, and it is a really a call to action in terms of looking at how do we um, respect the lives of all of us and to really look at the hard elements of disability in the challenges facing the Black Lives Matter movement and the significant op difficulties faced by law enforcement in um, ensuring safety for all. Um, that's also the week of Martin Luther King Day and the inauguration. So I think on a lot of points we're going to be a very, it's a very important, it's going to be a very detailed conversation around justice and our obligations and privilege and oppression. Um, now, moving on past that note, if there's anyone who lives and works in the D.C. metro area who is connected to mentoring, connected to disability, or special education, we have good news for you. We're hiring. Um, actually, at this moment, the res Respectability is looking for someone to run our National Young Leadership Program. Um, you can find full details on our website at respectabilityusa.org. Um, our fellowship director will be hired on to work directly with young professionals with and without disabilities as they look to become a new generation of intersectional leaders. Um, we're particularly looking at supporting and growing the diversity of the leadership of our community. Um, as um, a very powerful leader in our community put it, very often our leadership is pale, male, and stale. And uh, our, we're hopeful that our leadership program and the person who runs our leadership program will really be part of a movement to change that paradigm. So go to our website, respectabilityusa.org. You'll find the application materials. You'll find the job descriptions. Additionally, we've got a big announcement coming very soon about our fellowship program. So stay tuned. We got great exciting things ahead. Um, this is our contact information. Um, I will be sending out PDF copies of today's slides as well as a link to the YouTube video for everybody who participated today. Thank you so much. Thank you for participating and have a wonderful day.